Brandon Beavers, thank you for being my guest. Mm -hmm. And um, first question, you know, I have a lot of questions get prepared for podcasts, but my first question for you is three words. How are you? I think if I, uh, if I imagine the possibilities, I think I'm doing actually pretty good. Yeah, I'd say you are. So it's been five years ago this Sunday since, you know, I'm not going to say since your grief began or since the stages of grief started because we hear this all the time, mm -hmm. but it's been five years this Sunday since it, the, probably the most horrible day of your life. Mm -hmm. Do you want to go back to that day and talk about it at all or to, to kind of get where we're going to go in the podcast? Well, much of what you know about that day you've heard in the, in the news. Right. And... Um, but the ex but experiencing it myself, I was I was really in shock, mm -hmm. and um, I sat in a car for about eight hours on my way back from Mississippi, not really knowing what was going on, and uh, had news media people trying to reach out to me, and I hadn't even made it home yet to see my girls. Right. And that was my primary concern was my girls. Um. So. I, I was in shock. I was in shock for probably two or three weeks. Denial. Yeah. Did they? Did the people? How did you find out? Did you get a phone call? Did they? A, did they give you any information over the phone? I got a phone call at 5 a.m. from a female uh, attendee at the workout, saying that I needed to get down there to the church as soon as possible. There's been an accident, and I thought that she was in a car accident. So I, I didn't, I didn't, um, I didn't escalate it to that degree. Mm -hmm. But uh, she goes, "No, you don't understand. You need to get down here." And I said, "You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in Biloxi, Mississippi. I can't, right. I can't be there." And then uh, about ten minutes later, I get a phone call from that individual's husband, who I, who we know, me, me and Missy and everybody know this individual. And he said, "Brandon, you got You need to get down here." She he said, "Missy's long, no longer with us." Oh, so they told you over the phone. And I said, I said, I'm, I'm in Biloxi, Mississippi. We're supposed to be fishing, going out fishing this morning. And I have no way of getting back. And Missy's mom, Norma, was supposed to be at our house. Mm -hmm. um, because I was going to be out of town. She was going to stay to help, be there to help with the kids. But the storms that moved in that Sunday evening prevented her from traveling from Jacksboro, so Norma was stayed at home, and I didn't know that. Oh no! And so the kids were at home by themselves, and the nearest person I could call was my mom, who lives just you know a block or two, or you know a mile or so away. To go be with the girls. And um, and I don't I don't know if I even if I called her. I, there's some things I don't even remember. Oh yeah, I know. Um, but um, yeah, it was. So sitting in a car for eight hours, um, I don't really know what what I even what was going through my head for eight hours because you're just you can't do anything you can't react right and I didn't want to call I didn't want to hear my children's voices over the phone you, not did yet. not want to hear none of that and I wanted to be uh, you know physically present in front of them yeah before uh, you know things really started hitting the fan. So uh, anyway, I, when I got home, I tried to, there was a lot of people surrounding my kids, family and friends. There was lots of people at the house, thank goodness. Um, so I, I didn't get the one-on-one, -on -one, that, that initial, um, The, the reaction that, that you would think would un, uh, would unfold in front of with your children didn't unfold. So the other people, other people had already talked to your daughters. Absolutely, and they, they had been consoled for upwards of eight hours at this point. Really, by the time I got home. Mm -hmm. So when I got home, I felt some sense of uh, ease that the kids had already been taken care of on that level. A little bit of relief. So, I still avoided them, and uh, you know, then the news media shows up in your driveway, and 
I'm not a real, uh, I'm a very matter of fact kind of person. Mm -hmm. And uh, if there's a problem somewhere, I'm on top of it. I don't care what it is, I'm a, I'm a solution seeker. So my primary, uh, once I realized that they were taken care of, Right. Um, my primary focus at that point was to determine what happened and for some odd reason appeal to the media which was not a very good idea. Looking back, we'll just go there real quick, looking back do you kind of wish that of course hindsight's twenty twenty, but what you just said appeal to the media did you feel like you had to please everyone like answer everyone's questions and be there for everybody and i know you weren't there for yourself absolutely i, I did because as far as the media I, I felt um i felt like it was a tragedy not only for myself and the family that but i thought that you know my thinking was that there's a multitude of people in mourning over this. Right. And uh, I felt this, um, I felt like I was... Responsible? I felt like I was responsible for informing the media. I mean, not you know, yeah. inform them of what? And, uh, because it was too early to know or you know but everybody's asking you questions and you just feel like you've got i know the day after my mom died in the accident um we had so many people show up at the house i've never seen so much fried chicken in my life we had to freeze fried chicken but i felt so responsible to entertain everyone mm -hmm. and and my dad who has you know his his wife is gone i i had to move in actually for two months and live with him and so I felt like I was taking care of everybody else, and I know that's how you feel. Mm -hmm. And it started from that day. And so that's why I wanted to go back to that day. It started from that day that you take care of everybody else, and then later maybe get time to grieve. Yeah, well, I mean, that the immediate my immediate reaction was to address other people's concerns, not my own. Yeah. And much less my children. I kind of, I kind of, somehow mentally assumed that okay these they're the grandparents okay missy's mom and my mother were there and if anyone can console my children it would be the grandparents that's you know? right and uh and if it weren't for the grandparents particularly missy's mom she lived with us for about two years solid really? that's awesome and her her presence there in the house uh i you know yeah I, there's no way i could have done this as a as a dad you know no we have a family business so there's a lot of commitment you know on that and not that i would take that over what i was experiencing but i mean you know there's just so many things that you feel responsible for and uh you feel lacking in, in these other areas mm -hmm. you know and, and you know so um but yeah they uh they were, they were, they scooped, scooped the kids right up. What about your house? Are you still living in the no. same house? You moved. Got out of there. The, um, you know, there's two different, um, there's two different ways of looking at that kind of thing. If you're an older person, say 60 and older. Right. Where you've already started experiencing lose you where you've already started losing people close to you that's right you know potentially your spouse or your siblings um, maybe even a child right uh, an older person's going to want to stay in those in that house because that's where the memories are that's my dad and they want to hold on to everything mm -hmm. they don't ever want to throw anything away well in my case we're at the time we're dealing with uh 14 12 and I can't remember how old Sarah was five years ago, so it would have been eight years ago. She would have been eight. Uh, so anyway, um, we did stay there. I had no intentions of moving or anything, but uh, my middle daughter uh, in that typical uh, birth order mentality is the more introspective one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, she started things started getting to her and really yeah I'm so, so sorry needless to say um, 
with the walls talking, we had to get out of there. Yep. We left. And get a, kind of a fresh, just kind absolutely. of Absolutely. Clean, I mean, just totally different environment. Mm -hmm. And... Did you notice that that move after you made it helped? Absolutely. Immediately. Now, much to, much to Missy's mom's, you know, she had some reservations about that because this is a house that her daughter had helped build, you know, a home. But I could, I just, I, I had to pull the trigger on this and yeah. get them out. Well, she's looking at it from a mother's, mm -hmm. you know, and grandmother's perspective, and you're the spouse. And they say one of the hardest losses other than a child is a spouse. Mm -hmm. So you, you just saw that, hey, this is what I got to do for my girl. Life just gets kind of off, you know, off center for them in so many ways. So. And, and you know, there's, um, Missy's father passed away in December of 2014. Um, so Missy's mom endured that. We endured losing her dad. And then, you know, a short time, a year and a half, 18 months later or so, uh, is when we lost Missy. So mm -hmm. you can't imagine the pain that, that Missy's mom, Yeah. It's, it's bad. Yeah. And I worry about her, so. Well, <clears throat> and that's, that's a normal feeling to worry and it shows you're you're worrying about everybody else and you know when i contacted you it was about um complicated grief because i started thinking um because my mom was killed in a tractor accident on the farm six months short of their 50th wedding anniversary and i was talking on the not talking texting because my mother was deaf we only text we never talked on the phone we had just texted each other 30 minutes before the accident and sent selfies of each other um, and I, she had rollers in her hair and she would have hated that that was the last picture she ever sent me but we we had just got through talking so when I asked earlier about the phone call you know how did you find out about it I got a phone call too and I didn't believe them at first and the entire drive they said you just need to get here so a lot of similarities there you just need to get here to be with your dad well my dad was the one that didn't have great health my mom was in perfect health and I was like well where are you taking my dad thought they were going to a hospital they're like no your dad's in the ambulance we need you to come be with him and I was like okay well tell me they wouldn't tell me anything so I drove like crazy and that whole drive there is still fuzzy mm -hmm. you know when I got there it was immediately got to take care of my dad because my mom's gone they said you know Sue is gone and I'm like Sue who you know my mom your mom is gone I'm like okay and then they told me some details and I don't remember much after that, but I do remember I was like, you know, got to tell my daughter, got to, got to do this, got to contact this, got to contact the funeral home, got to all those things. And I, so you started lining out an agenda. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did I, you do oh, that? Absolutely. I, I had a piece had to of go paper. To the funeral home, uh, you know, um, pick out what dress Missy was going to wear, you know, coordinate things with the church, make sure the sound was got right. Um, yeah. I mean, when I showed up to my wife's funeral at the church, I showed up maybe an hour and a half early, and I spent all of that time running around the church making sure that this was in place, that was in place, um, that these people knew where they were supposed to sit. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just I'm just a busybody kind of person. Right. And if uh, if I don't feel like I'm being productive under any circumstance I feel I feel worthless so mm -hmm. and that was me I was writing out what I was going to say because I spoke at my mom's funeral and I was um telling the funeral director I think we need a chair for my dad because there's going to be a lot of people at visitation I was I just went in and actually the week of the funeral was a was an okay week for me because I wasn't thinking about what happened I was thinking about what has to happen now productivity right so I had a purpose mm -hmm. but anyway that that thought of grief i was almost jealous of people that were crying because i hadn't really even cried yet i was jealous that they were getting to grieve and i didn't have time to i was jealous that i was having to stay and live with my dad i love him and i, I cherish that time but i was jealous that i took him to the cemetery every night to watch him cry and i couldn't cry in front of him so 
that was there was I had a I had a lot of jealousy in that first few weeks of everybody else that was getting to grieve my mom and not me. Mm-hmm. And you probably felt that way. Yeah, but <clears throat> you know, I think the important thing to come from it is that you were able to analyze things on on a certain level that put you down the, uh, the right path no matter what. Yeah, you're right. Because you were going to do it anyway. You're right. So you you um, you already had the the innate ability to deal with things on a certain level. You just didn't mm-hmm. know it. Right. You were at least analytical enough about your uh, experience and your your what you, how you're supposed to react and all of these kinds of things that it's almost problem solving. You problem solved it yourself. You're right. And I can go further into that, but. Um, you know, it's, I don't want to go back, keep referring back to this uh, right. birth order thing, but you know, older, old, the older kids are tend to, tend to be the most independent and they don't need any help. Doing More headstrong. Anything, you know, and you know, I guess we're just, I'm just thankful that that's, that played into it somehow. Right, so. right. Now, going back, I thought of something just a minute ago. You know, I knew what happened with my mom and I knew what had caused it. You, you didn't know. So that week and at the funeral, were you worried about safety of your daughters or safety? Um, I mean... Well, we, I knew what happened specifically despite the fact that what you hear is not, okay? Right. But uh, absolutely not knowing who was resp- who did that, absolutely. I was scared to death. Yeah. I mean, I had, where, where we lived, there was a large, you know, fully developed cedar tree with about a 20 foot circumference base on it cut it up really oh, yeah. so somebody, nobody could hide uh, in hiding behind it um, the kids uh, because Missy wasn't there you know Missy typically took the kids to school uh, of course Norma was there but we, we lived about a hundred yards from the main road where the school bus stopped no way are my kids walking to the end of the street because no. once they get to that point they're out of view from the house mm-hmm. no way yeah um, yeah I mean I was scared did you have people like not even police but did you have people saying hey I think you should do this or helping you with ideas to protect your family or no <laughs> no I didn't even not even the cops that's kind of a shame no yeah I mean know. I was it was just uh, you know I think everybody anybody was in those in shock. circumstances would be would be fearful oh yeah and you know I put <laughs> I put uh I lit that place up. I mean, you could shoot a movie in my backyard. It was lit up that much. That's okay. And uh, but the local, uh, I lived in the county at the time. But it, but the nearest city police officer, he would patrol the street. That's awesome. You know, and he he I had a cell phone number. Uh, Good. So I felt comfort on some level with that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I mean, we didn't know. We didn't know. It's- we we didn't know if. Uh, you know, we didn't know what the motive was. We didn't know who the person was. If there was anything, whatever extenuating circumstances surrounding, we didn't know anything. So we were just, you know, we were scared. Still in shock, still mm-hmm. scared. And it's just how long did it, after April 18th of 2016, how long, or maybe you still are, how long did it take you to lose the the immediate fear always being like cutting down trees and yeah. like does your new house well, have trees or <laughs> yeah the, um and, and it was only one tree that i could cut because there wasn't many that existed but no it, I'm, that after about three months um it went away because you know um i don't really understand i don't really know how i uh, arrived in that comfort but i did mm-hmm. you know I think our bodies, and this brings me to the grief um, being different from complicated grief. You and I were talking earlier about how we thought that what we were feeling was just normal grief. And you know, I've lost grandparents before, but this was my mom and it was a tragic accident. And I was thinking, well, maybe this is just grief. This is just how it is. But then when I went to see my therapist and she's like, no, you're in complicated grief, complicated in the way that it happened. And in, in the, the literal sense. Yes. 
So, so it is so complicated. Grief is an adaptive process for the body, mm -hmm. but complicated grief is a disruption in that process. Mm -hmm. So complicated grief keeps your mind from making sense of anything. I'm going to tell you about the Monday night my mom was killed. That Wednesday, I was on the little four-wheeler headed out because it was a farm, headed out to check on my husband who was supposed to just be going to get my purse, but he didn't come back. And I, you might have done this. I started worrying about everybody that mattered to me. And I drove that four-wheeler so fast. This was the Wednesday after she died, just two days later, that I hit a plow that was underneath some grass, almost flipped the four-wheeler, had to get seven stitches in my elbow. The next day, I was backing my car out, and I scraped the whole side of my sister's car. My brain was not working. I was having accidents, like, like hitting my sister's car, having to get stitches. I couldn't think, and that is complicated grief. It totally disrupts any normal thinking that you're trying to have. Mm -hmm. So did anything like that happen with you? Like No, I uh, I was I was in shock for probably three weeks and then about the time that I got out of that denial stage, the investigation aspect is for my in my possible involvement in this took over. Right. And that drew me to another place for about three months. And then after that was over, uh, a lot of public speculation and crazy people started reaching out to our family. Uh -oh. So I had to contend with that. That lasted probably six to eight more months. Um, so I, I, I can honestly tell you that I didn't get a chance to grieve. No, because I mean, until uh, uh, maybe two years after. But and I can't even set, tell you, you know, these stages of grief. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I can really identify with is the anger. That's all I can identify with because the anger is not about so much as losing this person as it is about the whole, the entirety of the circumstances and everything. Um, all of it, every bit of it, and I was really angry. And maybe four months after, I mean, I didn't go to work for maybe three or four months, and I finally went back to work. And uh, I guess the kids were already back in school at this point, so, but I would sit at my desk, and I would just, I couldn't move. I was locked, and I was shaking, because I was so worried that uh, I was worried about my kids. Yeah. And, you know, they were involved in various things and I was worried about uh, making everything possible and trying to have a job. And, and they were probably worried about you. I'm sure they were, but I mean, I hit it pretty good. <laughs> I mean, I, that is they good. didn't, you know, they didn't know. But I mean, I can talk to him about all that now, but um, no, seriously, um, it, the, the bottom, the, the most important statement I have to make is that I feel like I was robbed of grief in the traditional sense, whether it's complicated or not, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and I'm angry about that. And, but I'm, I'm, I'm to some form of wreck of, uh, resolve and uh, reconciliation in that okay right so here we have a situation where you uh, where this happens and and we have unanswered questions mm -hmm. okay and i spend a great deal of my time um, fixated on who this person is what happened uh, almost to the extent of you know, of like some of these uh you know, some of these armchair detective folks out there. Oh yeah. You, I have to really question what their motivations are. I mean, it's all, it's there's a there's a psychology to that that fascinates me. What what why why are you so fixated on something like this? You know. Right. But on the flip side of that, I'm fixated on it at the same on the same level because I want answers. Okay. I want right. answers. Right. And. Uh, and rightfully so. So all of that. All of that, um, 
like I said, I, I'm a problem solver, and we have a problem. Yeah, we do. Big problem. So I tell I tell myself that I don't feel like I've grieved. Uh, you know, I've had sadness and and things, but the anger that fills me is so intense. Well, let's and, try uh, to let's try to get through some of that right now. We've got a platform right here. Um, what do you want to say to people out there right now that are still speculating? And still well, it, the anger is not directed at that. The anger is directed at, 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 at the entirety of my experience, okay? Like I told you, I, I was fed mi misinformation by the investigators in an effort to validate what I've already said or what I've told them or to, uh, to allow them some type of a backdoor uh, way of, of, val of validating you know my information okay okay I mean, they, they lied to me and they told me things uh, tell me more about that how do you I feel about the okay so I'm I'm mad because and I went back to the to the CID commander and I told him I said listen I have to sit you down and I want you to tell me of all of the things that y'all said to me what of it was false what of it was real right and you can't leave me like that Okay, you cannot leave me in this state of mind. I'm sorry. That's all he said. On the next episode of Think Theo. I understand their purpose behind that. Their purpose is to, if I were in fact involved, to allow that to just sit it, sit and eat at me like cancer mm -hmm. until something happens. You know, the deal, the situation with my father, that's, that, that's bull of the highest order. Be sure to subscribe to my podcast and my video cast on YouTube, which will have exclusive content not available on the podcast.